Good, I guess, officially afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the National World War II Museum. Hello to our online audiences out there. Thanks so much for joining us for our monthly Lunchbox lecture series. Uh, today's lecture is entitled Unconditional Extermination, Operation Reinhard, and the SS Camps at Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. I am thrilled to be joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Jason Dawsey, who is part of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and, De uh, and Democracy here at the museum. Uh, Jason's been here with us uh, at the museum for a while, um, so he should be a familiar face to some of you in the audience. Um, he received his PhD in 2013 from the University of Chicago and is taught at the University of Southern Miss and the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Um, so today's lunchbox lecture, um, obviously these three camps uh, that I mentioned earlier are, are known as the Operation Reinhardt camps. Uh, I think everybody will learn a lot today because, you know, they're much less familiar, especially to American audiences in comparison to a camp like Auschwitz. Uh, the SS murdered more than 1.5 million Jews in these camps during World War II. And so hopefully this presentation will enlighten you with a detailed history um, especially of these camps in 1942 and 1943, and how they fit into the larger history of the Holocaust. So thank you and welcome. We'll save a little bit of time uh, at the end for your questions. Now, before I turn it over to uh, Jason officially, uh, we thank AARP for sponsoring this Lunchbox Lecture Series, so here's a little bit more about them. I think everybody knows who AARP is, but hey, let's check it out. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Hello, I'm Joanne Jenkins, Chief Executive Officer of AARP, America's largest membership organization serving people aged 50 and over. With more than 5 million of our 38 million members currently or previously having served in the military, we're in a mission to support veterans and military families. That's why we've created a wide range of free resources, tools, and community programs to help veterans and military families navigate their options and meet challenges head on. We've developed a job board that directly connects veterans and military spouses to employers wanting to hire them. And we have free resources that provide some military structure to starting a business. We know that when you're a military veteran caregiver, you start younger, care longer, and face many unique challenges. That's why AARP provides a free military caregiving guide containing important and timely information that you truly need. Because military veterans or service members are twice as likely to be a target for fraud, the AARP Fraud Watch Network, in partnership with Operation Protect Veterans, provides free action alerts detailing the latest scams directed at veterans and military families. And through our state offices nationwide, AARP can help you find the right opportunity to give back to your community and fellow veterans. To learn more about these and other resources, visit aarp.org slash veterans. Thank you. All right, welcome Dr. Dawsey and thank you. Chrissy, thank you very much. And let me just thank everyone for being here today. I really appreciate you coming out um, for this talk. I know this is not exactly um, conventional subject matter for a lunchtime discussion, but I feel it's really important uh, to cover this topic. And so before I get into this, the, the topic at all, I just want to mention, I think, three reasons why doing something on Operation Reinhard in these particular camps is really important, especially in the U.S. and especially in right now. Chrissy's already alluded to the fact that these camps are much less well known. Um, most Americans, I think if you were going to ask them if when they about Nazi camps, I would bet I don't have a lot of money in my pocket, but if I had a lot of money in my pocket, I would bet on two that most Americans know Auschwitz, they know the name. We could talk about why they know that name. 
and probably Dachau, which is not an extermination camp, a concentration camp, but one liberated by the U.S. in late April 1945 would probably be the other. Some Americans might know about Buchenwald, another concentration camp liber liberated by the U.S. or Mauthausen. Anyway, we could go on and on about what we think they, you know, Americans might know, but Belzhets, Sobobor, and Treblinka, probably not so much, and there are reasons why that. Second thing about the significance of this is I thought after attending my, my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Popowitz's lecture, she's here with us, uh, she gave a lecture on the Holocaust by bullets, and I think several of you were there for that, that that topic which really deals with mobile, Nazi mobile murder squads in the Soviet Union also happened in occupied Poland, but primarily in the Soviet Union. So between one and one and a half million Jews are, are shot. They're not taken to camps. There's no poison gas involved in their murder. They're typically shot very close to where they lived. That they're in filling in gaps, like, well, what would you want people to know about next, especially since Auschwitz is so familiar, I thought, well, the Operation Reinhardt camps really are, in many ways, the next step. And then third, I've mentioned Auschwitz a few times already, so I thought I would, I'm going to kind of go back, I'm going to come back to these two gentlemen in a second, but I thought I would just note right here that there's a kind of Auschwitz-centric interpretation of the Holocaust that I want to put on the table for us today. And what I mean by that, I don't, I don't want this to be misunderstood at all, that the attention given to this camp is understandable, why we know it, why we're so familiar with it. Some 1.1 million Jews are murdered there in World War II. We think about 70,000 or so Poles 25,000 Roma, 15 to 20,000 Soviet prisoners of war. You could also add smaller numbers of other groups, but it's the scale of it is simply overwhelming. And I went to Auschwitz-Birkenau, thanks to the, the museum. I went on a tour with Dr. Alex Ritchie, a good friend of the museums, in late May, early June. I had never been to Poland at all, and we spent an afternoon in Auschwitz-Birkenau. I have to say I dreaded that part of the trip and at the same time knew I needed to be there. I needed to see it. So these are photos I took, some of the, the images I think most of us often associate with Auschwitz-Birkenau. This first one, of course, the, the famous lying sign of Arbeit mach frei, work will make you free. That's the entrance really to Auschwitz I, the original camp constructed. The, this, of course, the second image on the right is the, the image people always remember because where trains would enter Auschwitz II or Birkenau where the main extermination camp was, uh, four gas chambers and operations of a crematoria there. This, of course, both of these images I think most people are familiar with. But it's interesting, especially looking at this quote, and I, I, I thought about different quotes I might use here. So this quote from Theodor Adorno, he was a German intellectual who came to the States in 1938. He was half Jewish, his father was Jewish, his mother was from a Catholic background. He was a radical leftist, got out though in 1938, spent the war in the US, uh, became an American citizen, which he really worked to keep his citizenship. He goes back to Germany in 1949, to West Germany. And, you know, and I think people have stereotypes about radical leftists and the like, but Adorno was deeply committed to building a democratic Germany, and he taught at the University of Frankfurt for many years. And this quote, I think, is really indicative of this interpretation of the Holocaust focused on Auschwitz, that Hitler has imposed a new categorical imperative, a, a term indebted to German philosophy to the philosopher Immanuel Kant. That's a, a big fancy way of saying something that's binding on all of us, an imperative, binding on all of us as human beings. That in the state of their unfreedom to arrange their thinking and their conduct so that Auschwitz never repeats itself so that nothing similar ever happens again. And this was a very important moment in the post-war period of this notion of never again and after Auschwitz. And you'll even see, if you're interested, people talking about art after Auschwitz, morality after Auschwitz, 
theology after Auschwitz. Like, it's a rupture. It's a break. Things will never go back to where they were before. And it's interesting, I don't want to at all call into question the fact that we should remember Auschwitz, but the issue is, for me, is whether we want that to stand in for the entire genocide. The experience of victims, both those who perished and those who survived at Auschwitz, we can't just map that on to what happened to people who were victims of the Einsatzgruppen, who perished in the ghettos across Eastern Europe. And for that matter, we can't even conflate it with the other camps that operated in Poland at the same time. Auschwitz-Birkenau we need to deal with separately. If you've ever been there or read a book about it, you wouldn't believe the vastness of the place. It's huge, hundreds of acres. And you think the Nazis dedicating the kind of resources there, and what are they doing it for? Either working people to the last drop of energy they have or just simply murdering them. So it's not a surprise that we remember. Elie Wiesel was at Auschwitz. Primo Levi was at Auschwitz. Charlotte Delbo, Olga Lingel, we could name a whole series of people whose memoirs we know and read and study. They all went through this camp. Anne Frank, right outside here, a statue of her here at the museum. She was briefly there before being deported to Bergen-Belsen late in the war where she perished shortly before liberation. All of these figures we connect to Holocaust memory went through Auschwitz-Birkenau. Why? So that may be itself a question that so many of the survivors we associate with the Holocaust really at this one camp. When we get to Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka, the question of survivors becomes a much, much smaller group. Now let me just backtrack for a second. I just want to show a couple of images here. I'm going to do this very briefly about two people that whose work has informed my thinking on this topic, and in fact, the title. From the left is Isaac Deutscher, a Polish Jew from Galicia. His father really wanted him to be a rabbi. He was born, as you see, in 1907. As a young man, though, he began to increasingly identify with Jewish heretics and free thinkers, and he eventually com completely broke with his religious upbringing and became in the 1920s a revolutionary socialist. But he was a revolutionary socialist, but an anti-Stalinist. And he gets out of Poland, I'm having to just condense a lot, he has a fascinating life, he gets out of Poland in 1939, he comes to the UK and writes for a number of periodicals, he gets to know George Orwell, not surprisingly, both he and Orwell, both socialists, but anti-Stalinist socialists. So they, they have their own disagreements, but they know each other quite well. He publishes one of the first scholarly biographies of Stalin. Despite his hatred for the man, he tries to give a good scholarly assessment of Stalin's life while Stalin was still very much alive. It appeared in 1949. He then went on to write a major three-volume biography of Leon Trotsky, whom he greatly admired and did a lot to clear up many things that the Stalin regime said about Trotsky in the 20s and 30s before murdering Trotsky in 1940. It's Deutscher who coined this phrase, unconditional extermination. He had family, including his father, who perished in Auschwitz. And late in his life, and it's not surprising, I think, for those of us working at the museum, late in his life, he began to think more and more about the Holocaust. And despite his Marxism, which has a very distinct interpretation of history, Deutsche began to wonder if it was really comprehensible, the mass murder of millions of people like this. Could it really ever be grasped? But this phrase, unconditional extermination, as I'll get to here in a few minutes, I think this really says it all about how we understand this. On the right is Yitzhak Arad. He was born in 1926. It was then Poland. It is now Lithuania. As a young man from a Jewish family, very committed to Zionist politics. So if we have Deutscher, a, a Marxist, Arad was a Zionist and very much involved in efforts to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. During the war, he is incredibly fortunate, as he would always say, that he survived. Most of his immediate family perished. 
during the conflict, but he is able, in fact, to escape deportation and fought with Soviet partisans. As that, this is a story for many of you know, the movie Defiance or the book, right, about the Bielski brothers. That's not so much his story, but it's a similar one, fighting the Germans and fighting pro-German collaborators. And Arad, in fact, in the 1970s, fought from 35 years, in fact, after the war ended, he writes a memoir about his time as a partisan. He will serve in the Israeli military after World War II. If Deutscher, in many ways, is very skeptical about Zionism, uh, Arad was deeply committed to it. And, of course, then he goes on to be a key figure, chair, in fact, of Yad Vashem, the chief site for Holocaust remembrance in Israel for, for, some, for a couple of decades. And he wrote, in fact, the first major work, scholarly work in English on these three camps, the Operation Reinhardt camps. It came out in 1987. I would highly recommend it. It's a demanding book, as you might imagine, but uh, very good. Chrissy has my copy of it in the back if people are, are curious. But uh, if you're going to deal with this topic, you're going to go through a Rod's work. So he's a survivor historian in his own way. So that said, ladies and gentlemen, why don't we just get into the, the subject matter at hand and you can think about where do you, you know, want to begin a talk like this. And I think there's only one place you begin or certainly with one figure you begin, and, or in this case two, even though Himmler in this case is much more directly involved. The two architects of genocide, Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich. This photo is a pre-war photograph but says a lot, I think, it just it captures something about their own kind of working relationship. I don't think it requires a lot of background to say that Heinrich Himmler, I think most of us are familiar with him. He is the Reichsfuhrer head of the, of the SS, the elite Nazi organization. He, until very late in the war, is one of Hitler's most trusted subordinates. And along with one of his most trusted subordinates, Reinhard Heydrich, these are the two key figures who plot and carry out the annihilation of six million European Jews in addition to hundreds of thousands, millions of, of others. Roma, Soviet citizens, they're also involved in uh, other annihilation policies, which I'll mention later today. So a few things, ladies and gentlemen, about Himmler, very specific here about what his role is that I think helps us understand Operation Reinhard. Himmler, right after Poland is defeated in September 1939, Hitler gives him a post, a special post in addition to his SS duties, which you could only get in this Nazi lexicon. He is given the task of strengthening Germandom throughout the Reich, right? That's his task. So there is actually an agency created that he will lead entrusted with this. When you get past the lexicon, what are we talking about and why would that matter here? He's entrusted with territories in Western Poland that the, Germany is directly annexing, that he is entrusted with Germanizing those territories, he, which will also mean cleansing them of Poles, cleansing them of Jews. And to do these tasks, he will have special prerogatives with Germany's Ministry of Transport. What does that mean? It means when he wants trains for use for his agency, he gets them. If he needs 20 trains, he needs 40 trains, he gets them. Originally, these are designated to repatriate ethnic Germans from elsewhere in Eastern Europe into these areas of Western Poland known as the Wartegau, for those that will show a map here in a second. But this gives him a lot of authority on moving people around. And in turn, he will allow his SS and police leaders, we're going to see one of those in a second, he will entrust them. They will have the option of in lieu, like in other words, I don't have to sign off of this. He can entrust one of his subordinates and say, I need trains for this particular mission and it's handled. And this leeway that he has will be really important. Heydrich will actually say less about here, but I'm happy when we get to our Q&A at the end if you have any questions about his role. He's certainly involved, but Himmler actually has a figure 
He's handpicked to handle what would be called Operation Reinhard. So speaking of the German presence in Poland, these are maps, by the way, I should give credit where credit's due to the Holocaust Museum in DC. These are their maps. And you can see here, these are maps from 1941, which that's the key year here. Maps that have come into effect really apply after the Operation, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union in June, 1920, uh, June 1941. You can see here the Vartigal, I just mentioned this area in the west that's been annexed. This area in the center called the general government is a very strange term. I don't know that I really have any explanation for you about why they chose it, but the general government is an area of Poland that is directly occupied, but is under civilian authority. It's headed by a man named Hans Frank. He's a fanatical Nazi, but he's not SS. He's not army. He's civilian. He's based in Krakow, the beautiful Galician city here. You can see kind of in the southwest of the general government. And Frank is entrusted with running the general government. This is going to actually be kind of a point of contention with the SS early on in this history. But I noted about Himmler Germanizing the Vartigal. So where are Jews and ethnic Poles going to be moved if they're being relocated out of there? They're being quite literally dumped, and that's Frank's word. He's outraged by this, but not a lot he can do about it. Jews and Poles are being moved across the border into the general government and concentrated there. And you'll see ghettos, if we're dealing with the Jewish population here, ghettos in Warsaw, in Lviv, in Lublin, in Wo I mean, they're, they're just all over. There's also, you know, we could get into the issue about where these ghettos are and how many people at any one time. And it doesn't happen overnight. So you can see the city here, Woj, in the eastern part of the Vartigal. Jews will eventually be moved out of there, but they're concentrated there initially. So the general government, then if you looked on the right, as I think you can really see my subject matter today, the names all appear on there, that this is where Operation Reinhard, this phase of the Holocaust really begins. You can see in yellow, right, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzets in that right-hand side map, showing all of these places, how close they are to one another, why they're where they're at, and we'll say a little bit more about the choice of these places in a minute. But we at least can kind of show you a frame of reference for our discussion. Now, let me say something about Operation Reinhard, the terminology, and this is going to sound probably uh, not terribly helpful. There's a long argument to this day about the term. Why did they call it that? In German would be Aktion Reinhard or Einsatz Reinhard, usually just rendered in English as operation. Is that named after Reinhard Heydrich, this chief subordinate? Maybe. It's a good guess. But it's not really sure, there's not real certainty about why that name, it certainly did stick. It certainly is how we think about it now. Who is it named after? We're not sure. What we do know is that Himmler, by no later than mid-October 1941, had settled on Operation Reinhard. And the person that he entrusted to carry this mission out, I'm going to talk in a second about what exactly this entailed, but the person he decided to execute this mission is the man on the far left, Odilo Globochnik, not a Nazi I think most of us really encounter or are aware of. This is actually him out of his SS uniform because prior to World War II, he's, he is from Austria and is chosen as Gauleiter of Vienna. So he's, that's Gau, right? The, that's a Nazi term is for an administrative district. And in this case, he's entrusted with managing the former capital of Austria now annexed, become part of the Reich itself. He's appointed in 1938, and he is so, <laughs> he's so outstanding in his job that he doesn't even last a year. 
In January 1939, there are charges made against, against Globochnik for corruption, and he is sentenced, found guilty on those charges, and it looks like his career is over in the Nazi party. However, Himmler likes him. And Himmler, that year, will pardon him. And starting in the fall of 1939, finds great use for him in the general government area of Poland. Globocznik, because of the fact Himmler pardoned him, is fanatically loyal, not only to Nazi ideology, but to Himmler personally. So when the decision is made for Operation Reinhardt, Himmler doesn't even have to think about it very much. He already knows Globocznik. He's been in Poland for two years. He believes that he will get the job done. Globocznik, in turn, the man in the middle, speaking of another figure not very well known, named Hermann Hufle, will be his chief subordinate, his right-hand man. So when Globocznik has concerns about can they carry out the mission Himmler has assigned them, he knows Hufle will do everything he can to carry it out. These two men are responsible, leaving aside people up the chain, but responsible for the deaths of roughly one and a half million Jews in the general government as part of Operation Reinhardt. What Operation Reinhardt was, was a concerted systematic effort by the Nazi regime to annihilate Jews living in Poland, primarily the general government. They're also brought in from the Wartegau, you'll also see Jews brought in from elsewhere outside of Poland, but primarily this is a Polish phenomenon here. I'll say more about that in a second. Now, who's the man on the right? Victor Brock. It's important for us, ladies and gentlemen, to remember this is before we're in the fall of 1941. Himmler's decided by mid-October Globochnik has the task. The Nazi regime has already been involved in mass murder for two years. And starting in the fall of 1939, they begin killing people with disabilities, physical and mental disabilities. So this timetable, I hope, helps us, and that doesn't muddy the waters. Started in the fall of 1939, six killing centers in Germany and Austria. They murder 70,000 adults by the summer of 1941, before word gets out about the program in Germany, and there's an outcry. Hitler himself, who had sanctioned the killing of the disabled, we actually have a written order, which he didn't, he very rarely did, and certainly did, didn't do it with the genocide of European Jews. He signed an order about the killing of the disabled. Word gets out. He orders a halt to the killing of adults with disabilities in August 1941. The killing of children, by the way, never stops. That continues. But the adults, he orders it stopped in August. By that point in August, the Germans have been in the Soviet Union for two months. The Einsatzgruppen that Dr. Popowitz dealt with, they have been at work for two months. Hundreds of thousands of Jews have been murdered already. We have to keep these chronologies kind of together. So, these personnel, part of the T4 program, the clandestine program for murdering the disabled, what are you going to do with them? In the fall of 1941, Himmler, with Hitler's sanction, he would have never done any of this without Hitler's full approval, he has missions for them. So, Victor Brock, who did the day-to-day -day managing of the murder of the disabled in Berlin, not SS, not in any formal way. This is a program run out of Hitler's private chancellery. He and Globochnik will work together to find just the right personnel to carry out Operation Reinhardt. Brock knows who are the best people to do the job. And we'll get into something about these individuals. Let's, there we go. Not the best photograph. But I, an individual I want to talk about here for a few minutes. A Nazi, I think, is probably one of the, he's probably one of the least familiar Nazis, and yet his importance for the Holocaust in Poland is difficult to overstate. Christian Wirt, 
He had been a key figure. He has a police background. He had been a Nazi very early on in the early 1920s, a true believer if there ever was one. Wirt had been a figure in the T4 program. He'd worked at two different killing centers, absolutely ruthless, including with his own subordinates. And Golbochnik, after talking with Brock, realizes, I want this man. Now, Globochnik, ladies and gentlemen, when he's doing all of this, the only person he has to check in with about who he's chosen, what they're going to do and when, is Himmler. In other matters, and this is going to sound very confusing, outside of Operation Reinhard, if Globochnik wanted to do other things, he had other missions or tasks, he couldn't just do what he wanted and get Himmler's approval. It's a very bizarre chain of command, but in the case of Operation Reinhardt, only Himmler. Himmler likes this choice. Wirt will be the commandant of the first of the Operation Reinhardt camps at Belgetz. And because of his expertise, and I'm using that in quotes, with the murder of the disabled, he comes right away with ideas about what to do when Polish Jews brought in from, at the start, elsewhere in the general government began to arrive. There's kind of a delay, I think, on our... So let me just quickly kind of go through this, watching our time. You can see here this first camp. It's constructed, by the way. There had been... Poles involved, Polish workers involved in building the camp. Then later, Jewish forced laborers are brought in to help build this camp. That had started already at the beginning of November 1941. So just a few weeks after Himmler gives Globochnik the order to undertake this mission, they're already starting. Right? So in this case, you can see, I'm going to move over away from the mic just direction from the northwest. You can see there's a tank ditch on the outside. Then there's an administration and reception area where these individuals who were brought in by train, you're familiar with this, cattle cars, would it on average you think you're packing human beings in there, maybe could hold 60. The SS are typically putting 120 to 150 in there at a time. It's literally nobody can even sit down inside. They would often bring them in 20 rail cars at a time into this administration and reception area. This is what Virat is designing, right? And I'll say more about this here in a second, what exactly this means, the tube. This is a key phrase in the terminology of Operation Reinhardt. But this structure, you will see something similar, adapted, modified in both Sobibor and Treblinka. They're working off designs that Virat and his team had, Globochnik signs off on it, but he's the innovator with this whole operation. He's also, in many ways, a kind of, I'm using the word loosely here, a kind of intellect behind it, because Virt, Yitzhak Arad really draws our attention to this. Virt has very specific ideas about murdering huge numbers of people all at one time. I want to say something about, I think I need to flash ahead. Yeah, I'll come back to that image in a second. There's three requirements for an efficient process. You need deception. So when men, women, and children are brought in to Belgets, the first transports arrive in the middle of March, 1942, just a few weeks after the camp is deemed ready. When they start being brought in, Virt has a team of about 20 to 40, depending on when, 20 to 40 SS there. 
he thinks are handpicked people he can depend on. He will have assistance from others, but we'll just start with that. When Jews arrive, they're told they're in a transit camp. They're going to be moved further to Ukraine. That's the ruse. They're told, will sound very familiar, they're going to have to go through a process of clean, you know, kind of getting cleaned up for the journey that will happen. So that's the first thing. Everybody has to be on message when people arrive. You think when you've got 20 freight cars filled with human beings arriving in the camp at any one time, and Virt, by the way, is insistent that no poles are allowed in. So if you have a guy driving a locomotive and he's Polish, he cannot by any means set foot in the camp. There has to be a part of Virt's team brings those rail cars on in. This kind of secrecy has to be maintained. It's interesting in how successful or not Virt is, people will argue we certainly know of cases of Polish rail workers who learned very quickly what was happening inside the camp. But they're brought in, everybody is on message. And then speed. You cannot have, Virt says, people figuring out something nefarious is at foot. So you have to do this very quickly. So people are brought into that reception area I mentioned. They're told to set aside all their valuables. And in fact, there are even people in Virt's team who make sure they're neatly set up, leading a person to think, I'm gonna be able to reclaim these right after I go through the process. They go to that degree to carry out the ruse. We'll actually see in a place like Sobibor, the SS team there will encourage Jews to write postcards home that everything's okay. So that's done, right? You set your valuables aside and then you're herded through this area and herded, I'm not using that word incidentally, Virt's team will kick, whip, drive people through this area they call the tube. It's a corridor that's going to take them right to the gas chamber. The skies, of course, as a bath, as showers. There's even all the official language overhead. This is a place for bathing, for showering. All of that's there. They're being pushed through very quickly. Men separated from women and children. Virt's estimation is he prefers to murder the men first. He thinks they're more likely to give him problems. But this has to be done very rapidly because people will begin to connect dots. Something is not right here. And of course, people did eventually begin to connect the dots. And the third part of this is that Jews will be compelled to do most of the labor in the camp, including removing bodies, extracting gold teeth. They will do a lot of this work. And then, of course, the people that the SS has chosen to do this horrifying work of course, they're all murdered, and then there'll be another group in their place that will do it. So this is Virt's innovations at Belgez. Let me go back just for one second to this image here, and I'm watching our time. To me, this is one of the most terrifying images that comes out of the history of the Holocaust. When you see these men on the left, these are people, these are SS personnel working under Virt at Belgez. I won't go through all of their names. These are figures you would never have heard of. But what we can say about them is they're professional mass murderers. That's what they do for a living. Their job is to ensure everything goes as smoothly as possible. The number that Globochnik will give Virt and then the other commandants at Sobobor and Treblinka is that something like 2.9 million Jews, that's your task, is to murder them. So these men, that's what they do for a living. We even have photos of them enjoying recreation. You know, during their off time, they grab an accordion and get a large glass of beer and they hang out. And then they go back to the task at hand on the following Monday. We, have, we know a lot, in fact, about the routines of these individuals. Assisting them on the right 
a group of non-Germans, and this is itself a, a story that it deserves its own lecture, really, are personnel trained in the general government at a place called Traniki. It's actually close to the city of Lublin, major Polish city industrial center. And there the SS trained personnel who would be able to assist in Operation Reinhardt and eventually in other missions. There's a stereotype that's persisted that most of these men were Ukrainian. There were quite a few of them who were Ukrainians, but there were also people from Lithuania, from Latvia. There were some Russians who were involved. There were a small number of Poles. And ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the most remarkable things. The SS on Heydrich's order would go into POW camps where Soviets were held, Soviet soldiers were held, and they would recruit. They would try to find out individuals who were fervently anti-communist, no Jewish background, of course, and if they were satisfied that they knew a lot about the background of these individuals, they would give them an opportunity to serve as part of this camp personnel. You got paid, your prisoner of war status was revoked, you had home leave opportunities, and given the fact that the conditions in these German military-run POW camps were nightmarish, right? Three million Soviet prisoners of war perish during World War II, most of them not at the hands of the SS, the hands of the German army. So these individuals often jumped at the chance. What they, of course, are going to be compelled to do, and they went through special training for it at Troniki, was murdering people, pushing them through the so-called tube, they would also, individuals who could not actually, they were too, they were sick, they were, they were disabled, whatever they might be, they couldn't actually go to the reception area and that whole process, go through the tube, they were then just taken by a different route to pits behind the gas chambers and shot. And these Troniki personnel do a lot of that killing. Probably a hundred there's different estimates about how many of these men there are at, at different camps, but if you think there are 20 to 40 SS at the Operation Reinhardt camps, let's say roughly 200 of these Troniki camp personnel, and especially as the, the, the transports got larger as the war were on, they do more and more of the actual killing. We've seen that already. I thought I would also just show some images of here about some of the other camps, just watching our time. It's amazing how time can get away from you, but I thought I would just point out here, ladies and gentlemen, that Wirt will be the commandant in the spring of 1942 at Belgetz, and then he will move on and help set up the two other camps as part of Operation Reinhard, Sobibor. We actually, just a couple of years ago, the Holocaust Museum came into possession of hundreds of photographs of Sobibor nobody had really ever seen before. It's amazing we can actually now look at it. We had survivor accounts who said the place looked like a farm. And so it's interesting when you can see a little bit of it, the kind of main entrance here, of course, of the SS banner prominently displayed. Another shot, you can see a fence running around the camp. It's Sobibor. So Wirt is there. He will work with another member of a former member of the T4 program, people involved in the killing of the disabled named Franz Stangl, who is the first commandant at Sobibor. Then Wirt will go on to Treblinka. And each time they tweak his model established at Belgetz. And by the time you get to Treblinka, you have a truly massive operation there. But Virt is really the kind of inspiration behind it. And for what it's worth, ladies and gentlemen, I thought I would just mention to you, since I talked about Auschwitz at the beginning, Virt and the two-time commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hurst, they hate each other. They're huge rivals. Virt really sees Hurst as a kind of upstart. Hurst sees Virt as a kind of, kind of looks down on him. Huss had come through Dachau. He had done his training there, dealing with often political prisoners. And it's at Auschwitz, of course, that Huss comes up with an innovation, 
which is that Virat had insisted that the way to kill individuals was using carbon monoxide gas pumped in to these, ch these gas chambers via an engine sitting in an adjacent room is very similar to what had been done with the disabled, except this is on a much bigger scale. Huss, of course, is the innovator in his own right where he chooses Zyklon B, a pesticide, and the, the two of them have this great animosity between them about who could be more efficient in what they were doing. This worth noting. Just thought briefly here I would show an image of Franz Stangl, the commandant at Sobobor. And you can see, I mentioned about the SS officers relaxing, having a cigarette, drinking beer. That's actually on the premises at the Sobobor camp. I think it's late 1942, early 1943, but just relaxing and hanging out. And I thought kind of just showing numbers here, and I, I want to have at least a few minutes for questions. I thought I would move forward a little bit and just show you some or point out some numbers. With this image, I thought would be a, maybe a, a good place to kind of wrap up. Belgets begins operations operations in quotes, mid-March, Sobobor, May 1942, Treblinka, July, about eight weeks apart. That's how quickly, order given in October 1941, by July 1942, these three camps are fully operational. Mostly at the start, Jews from the general government are being deported there to be murdered. Belgets, one of the reasons why we don't know anything about it, or know anything about it, we know very little about it, opens in March. By October, November, it's done. The camp itself is not fully closed, dismantled, until the following summer of 1943, but most of the murder operations there halt after six to seven months. 430,000 Jews, mostly Polish Jews, murdered there in six to seven months. Sobibor, opening in May, it will continue operations for over a year. We think about the numbers vary, like the Holocaust Museum puts them about 170,000, some people more a quarter of a million. That camp, of course, will stay in operation fully until there's a big uprising there in October of 1943, where led by a Polish Jew, the son of a rabbi, and a group of Soviet Jewish officers who were recently moved there. They led an uprising on October 14th of 1943. They literally charged the gates after murdering, that's not the right word here, after dispatching, they kill several SS officers. It's a very well-coordinated plot, and we think at least 58 of them get out of the camp and survive the war. It's remarkable. After that, Himmler orders the camp closed. Treblinka will be the main center, as you see here. This image on the left are Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto being forced onto trains to be taken to Treblinka. Treblinka is about 80, or mo 80 miles or so from Warsaw in the northern part, if you remember the map. Maybe I should have brought the map back. About 80 miles or so from Warsaw. It's staggering, ladies and gentlemen. So the camp is, there's an uprising there in August of 43, prior to Sobobor. Himmler will order it closed shortly thereafter. We think 900 to 925,000 people are murdered there. So this killing frenzy takes place over really a period of about 18 months. Now, Auschwitz Birkenau, which doesn't close, of course, Auschwitz Beer Canal will be open the entire time for operations. And once these Reinhard camps are closed, because mostly the Jews that have been targeted, most of them are gone. It will then take the full, it will really be the, the, the camp that Jews brought from all over Europe, from France, from Greece, from Italy, from Norway, are brought to. It, of course, stays in operation. It's not liberated until January 1945. It's farther west than the Reinhard camps. The areas of the Reinhard camps were liberated in July of 1944. 
So ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I want to hear, have time for a few questions. Why I chose the title Unconditional Extermination, I think it gives us some sense of what the Nazis were doing here is a war. It's a war that's part of its larger war effort. When you dedicate the resources, the personnel, the energy, the intellect to murdering an entire group of people, in this case, you can't separate that from the larger war the Third Reich is waging. In other words, you can't just simply talk about Tiger tanks and 88s and Stukas and MG42s and lose sight of the fact that this war is also happening at the same time. For the Nazi leadership, at least, for these individuals I'm talking about here, that's one single war. And we need to understand it as such that had its own unconditional side to it. The killing frenzy doesn't stop until the Allies, either the US and the British from the West or the Soviets from the East, stop it in 1944, 45. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. Really, I, I know I learned a lot. Um, in uh, your lecture, so thank you for your time uh, and for your knowledge and for your research. Um, we now have some time, looking at the clock, about seven minutes or so for questions. Um, feel free to raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over. Please speak into the mic so our online audience can hear the questions. I'd very much appreciate it. For those online, you can actually ask questions on the various channels and we'll try to get to those too. David, I saw your hand first. Thanks. Jason, the uh, three individuals you talked of, uh, Himmler delegating responsibility for Operation Reinhardt, what became of them after the war? Great question. So David's question was about what happened to these three individuals I showed. So it's interesting, Operation Reinhardt is really wrapped up by the fall of 1943. And I should just add here that I wish I could conclude that on a triumphant note or at least giving people something positive, right? Because there is the uprisings. People did make it out of Treblinka, they made it out of Sobibor, two months apart. Himmler orders the liquidation of the Reinhard camps and to cap things off in Majdanek, some of you might know another camp, it was a forced labor camp, but also an extermination camp for a brief period near Lublin that he has people moved into Majdanek, worried about more uprisings. There's, by the way, this stereotype, right, about the Jews fight back. Of course they did. They did fight back. They fought back in ghettos. We know about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. We have these major uprisings in the camp. So on one single day, November 3rd, 1943, in Majdanek, Himmler worried about further uprisings. The SS shoot 18,000 people in a single day in Majdanek. They blast music over loudspeakers. It sits right next to Lublin, a major population center. They blast music for hours over the loudspeakers to drown out the shots and the screams, and they kill all 18,000 inmates there and people brought in from neighboring areas. In total, they kill about 41 or 42,000 people alone in the fall of 1943, and they call it, while the name is unforgettable, right? Operation Harvest Festival is what they call it. Now, David's asking about what happened to Globochnik after these camps are shut, what happens to Hufla. In Globochnik's case, he is reassigned, as is Virt. They're both sent to fight partisans in northeastern Italy and Yugoslavia. And we, I think, owe a debt of gratitude to the partisans because in January of 1944, they kill, it's a number of people actually we could kind of mention in here, but they, they will kill several people connected to Reinhard. Veert himself dies in August of 1944, killed by partisans. Globochnik stays there until very late in the war. He's arrested, and then after his arrest, he commits suicide. He knows what's going to happen. Hufla falls also into British custody. He had been involved in handling a lot of the deportations. Hufla will be in British custody for about two years, and then he actually will be a free man for many years. 
and then is arrested shortly after the Eichmann trial starts in Israel, living in Austria. He was an Austrian like Globochnik. And knowing that this time he's probably going to be convicted, he kills himself in his cell in the summer of 1962. Victor Brock, the T4 manager working with Globochnik, who do we pick? We have Virat, we have Stangl, these figures from the T4 program. Brock is captured and tried by the Americans, convicted and executed. So that's what happens to those individuals. Right. Welcome. Ma'am, you have a question? Um, I have a question and also a statement to make. Uh, a couple of days ago on PBS, there was a program called After Auschwitz. Five women who survived Auschwitz they came to America, and it tells about their lives and what they went through. Two of them have died since, but there are three left. My question is, uh, where did the term, from where did the term Holocaust come? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> a tough one. The term Holocaust is actually from the Greek. It began to be used shortly after the war, but didn't really probably become the term we know of it today until much later, until the 1960s and 1970s. Some of you may even remember in the U.S. there was a television series that came out called Holocaust. Meryl Streep, James Wood, there were a number of very high-profile actors. That series, in fact, did, uh, it was amazing how much of a response it got in West Germany and Austria, an American TV series about a Jewish family caught up in the genocide. But the term is very controversial because in Greek that would translate as something like a burnt offering, like a ritual sacrifice. So the association with fire became part of this because of the crematoria, no doubt. But ritual offering or sacrifice, that has a very different resonance than talking about the mass murder state-directed, continent-wide mass murder of millions of individuals. So there are many individuals, for example, the, the great Holocaust historian Saul Friedlander, he himself survived. He was in hiding in France. He doesn't like the term at all, doesn't like it. And then you ask him what, what would he prefer for these very reasons he doesn't like the term Holocaust, but he said, look, everybody uses it. Everybody uses it. Some people prefer the Hebrew word Shoah, which means catastrophe. But I think many of us in this room who went through Hurricane Katrina, catastrophe often has a natural disaster ring. Not always, but it can lead you to think that way. This isn't a natural disaster. These are human beings plotting and carrying out genocide. So Friedlander's answer to that quite literally was, it should be referred to as the extermination of the Jews of Europe by the Nazis. And he doesn't, he doesn't think the term extermination is insensitive. He's talking about how the Nazis envisioned their victims. And so he thinks that's, people will argue with him about terminology, but that's the term it has stuck. It people, that's the term people reach for every time, but it doesn't, it's not without its own controversy that I think we all should be aware of. I don't know that I have a better term. Sometimes I just simply say the Nazi genocide or the genocide of European Jews, which is more literal. I think many of you are aware of the fact, right? It's a Polish Jew, Raphael Lemkin, who makes it to the US. He coins the word genocide from a Greek and a Latin word, meaning the murder of a group of people in 1944. So it's a World War II word. There was no word prior to 1944 that we can think of. I mean, you could say the murder of a group, Right? But a term that really captured it is itself a World War II and Holocaust-related word. So I hope that answers your question. All right, I have actually one from an online audience. Uh, Jason, you and I were talking about like these camps are leveled, essentially. Uh, so this person's asking, like, what happens to the records? Because these camps don't really stand. They're dismantled shortly thereafter. It's a great question. I wonder if I can even... I, you know, things I didn't get to. There's some individuals from the Sobibor uprising. Uh, Leon Feldhendler on the far right, left image. He was the son of the rabbi, Alexander Pachersky, one of the Soviet officers, the really tall guy on the right-hand side. 
But thanks to my friend Jen, I even brought just a few images, like if you went today, what would you see? In Sobibor, you would see images like this, obviously of a mother and child, what's known as this memorial or memory mound at Sobibor. And thanks to Jen for these two images that she took when she was at Treblinka. These stones, Jen, that represents for every locale, right, that Jews are deported. They're supposed to kind of to capture something about that to remember it. But to answer the question that uh, from our online viewer, this has been one of the problems, of course, is that these camps were dismantled and the Nazis wanted it to be as if they never were there. They had teams that did this work. You know, there's literally, if you went to Belgets, why am I not showing you much? Because they plowed it over, they planted trees there. They even had like people that were hired to kind of watch over and make sure nobody tried to return and look for anything there. So they wanted to make it as if nothing is standing. Another reason why we remember Auschwitz-Birkenau because there's so much there you can see as opposed to the Operation Reinhardt camps. That goes uh, also for the, the records to the questioner was bringing about. So much of that is destroyed. What we do have, there are certainly some records up the SS chain that survive, including reports we, we know about individuals, an individual named Kurt Gerstein who testified after World War II, he personally witnessed a gassing at Belgets. I will not subject you to the details of that, but he told a court after the war about what he saw when he was there with Wirt. And so there's that kind of testimony. There are some survivors. I didn't mention, but the question that Chrissy is posing made me think of it. There obviously were survivors, people who escaped in the uprisings. And Belgets, as far as we know, until I see something else, I will continue to quote it, as far as we know, two survivors. That's it. There is no, there's hardly any survivor testimony to capture. So when we're thinking about what would we want our kids to read, right? If you're looking for a memoir by a Belget survivor, that's the problem. They weren't many. This is how efficient this process was in the 18 or so months that it operated. All right, maybe time for one more question. I know we're over one o'clock, but does anybody else in the audience have a question? Oh, David, I'll come back to you, sure. <laughs> Close it out for yeah. us. <laughs> Jason, you mentioned the photographs that are available now that were recently discovered. Uh, where wh do we have access to that? Is there a way to view that? I don't know if all of them can, if they've all been digitized yet, but the Holocaust Museum, if you go to their site and type in Sobibor, You'll be able to pull this up. I don't know how many of them are available, but a couple of those images I took right out of those. It's a huge repository. It's been an amazing discovery because you actually get a much fuller sense of what the camp looked like prior to the uprising and then it being totally dismantled. But the Holocaust Museum does have at least many of those images available. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Jason Dawsey, for your knowledge. Thank you all Everybody, very much. A round of applause. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you for the next Lunchbox Lecture. Glad to have you here. Have a great day.